Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Limitless Outdoors podcast brought to you by Eberly Stock. And today, I'm going to be talking with Josh and Adam. We have uh, over here the worst shed hunter on the planet, and we have over here probably one of the better shed hunters on the planet. And so what we want to kind of dive into to today is kind of tapping into some of Adam's experience and his tactics. And, you know, he's trained his dog to find antlers. I mean, it's just a he's very dedicated to the hobby of looking for these sheds and specifically mule deer sheds. And so we're going to be really pressing into that today. And, uh, Josh was going to be answering some, asking some questions as we go and just kind of press into it and see if we can maybe help, help somebody that desires to be successful, maybe kind of bridge that gap in experience and become successful at finding some of these sheds. So. Yeah. Sounds good to me, man. I'd love to finally get some, <laughs> get some sheds. I get so frustrated when I see, uh, I'll see some of these YouTube videos and, and there's some particular ones that say they have this shed tour and there's, they're loaded down with sheds. Now I, I live in Northeastern Pennsylvania and we are covered up. We've got private land all over the place and trying to find a shed, like you can find sheds in there, but I, I just, my mind always just, yeah, I lose my mind when I see all of these Western hunters with all these sheds. How are you guys doing that? Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, it, it must be easy, right? Uh, it's definitely not easy. Um, and I think, uh, at least here, in the northwest we are so heavily timbered it's it's a challenging to uh scout and find animals and i think a lot of these guys that find just truckloads of sheds i mean they're able to watch uh 10 bulls or all these mule deer bucks on the winter range and go pick up their sheds so they're able to find just pickup loads we don't find pickup loads of sheds we mm -hmm. find i mean a good handful and i've definitely found maybe a couple of pickup loads in my life, but a lot of them are quality. And for me, what I think it is, is I grew up in it. So I have this knowledge of already of where they probably are. Like my, my dad and my grandpa, they picked up sheds their whole lives. And so I already have that base knowledge um, of where they, I could look for them. Okay. Okay. I want to stop you right there. Okay. So, <laughs> cause yesterday I went shed hunting. And I don't know what I was more surprised by the, the not finding any sheds or not seeing any animals because there was, there was more manure on the ground than I had ever seen in my life in the area that I was in. I mean, there was, there was like one pile here, one pile there, one pile there, one pile there. If I saw one pile of droppings, I saw a, a, a thousand. So you said knowing where to find the sheds. And I would have figured in my head, like that's the spot, you know, like somewhere I'm going to be running into at least one or two. So where, where do they normally drop sheds? How about that? Like, so it's going to be different for what I'm assuming you're looking for whitetail sheds. Yeah. That's that, in that's the what's, bottom. That's what's shedding right now. Yeah. So we're in, we're in North Idaho that's, and that's what they're shedding right now. Yeah. So whitetail sheds, I'm not an expert at finding whitetail sheds at, uh, at all but at least and it's a lot different here than it is where where i'm from you have more cultivated fields and private property where the deer just kind of flock to in the winter so you said you're finding all this sign i would assume that oh, if there are rubs too. Uh, yeah, yeah i would assume if there are any bucks around like there would be sheds there yeah. and i mean maybe you walked by some there's always that i mean even i walk by some that's why i have my dog um but you're not always guaranteed to find them because they, there's a lot of the same country around here in this valley. And so just because they were, they, there could be a hundred deer in the amount of sign you found, they could have made that in a day. Yeah. And so maybe no bucks shed that day. So you just got to keep looking for spots that look like that, where you know that they were wintering and hanging out and just keep checking those spots. And eventually you'll find where, oh, how four, about four bucks shed here? How about we start start, them start up? with this because this is a, a thought that crossed my mind. Yeah, and I, and the only reason why I knew that this wasn't the case was because Colton had been out just a few days ago and he picked up three sheds as you know in in about an hour or so, and so you know I I said um, in my mind I thought well maybe this is not the time of year that they shed. <laughs> You know, like, cause every, every region's different. You know, I didn't know if like, you know, I'm, we're in North Idaho. I'm used North, I'm used to Northeastern Pennsylvania and Georgia was, you know, before that. So, um, what time of year do, should people start looking for sheds? What time of year do 
you know, do whitetail shed, do other animal shed at different times, do elk shed differently than mule deer, you know, et cetera. So, yeah. So up here, the whitetail shed anywhere from Christmas to mid February. I mean, some hold on to, I've seen some hold on to them into March, which is bizarre, but the majority, I think the majority of whitetail shed in January. And so if you're specifically going after whitetail sheds, mid to late January is a probably, I would say 80% of the bucks have shed. And so you good odds that you, you'll find them. And then mule deer, they're a little bit later. The earliest I found a mule deer shed was February 10th, but I know of guys finding them in late January. And I guess it probably depends on the year, the winter. Um, but they, I would say the majority of them shed in, in February. And then you got elk that they, they don't shed until mid March through April. Oh, okay. Okay. The, usually the big bulls, they'll shed late March and then all the other bulls will shed in, in so, April. So I might have been in, in elk because a lot of the droppings I saw were not whitetail. You know, so I might have yeah. been in a bunch of, yeah. you know, I might have been following a herd because, I mean, I'd see, you know, we still have snow. We have snow on the ground and, you know, it's it's patchy, but um, I would see just really large hoof prints. And I was like, that's not a deer, you know? So, yeah. so I might've also been in, in an elk herd, yep. you know, trying to, trying to figure that out. But so, so why do you think that that's, that that happens? Why do you think that, you know, they all, I mean, so whitetail and mule deer, they're both deer. Well, why are they shedding at different times? What do you think? I don't really have a clear <laughs> answer for that. I don't know. That's You're just not a the biologist. way it is. I'm not a biologist. Yeah. That's just the way it is. And that's, gotcha. that's what we've always known. Gotcha. And gotcha. figured that out. But um, yeah, definitely knowing when they shed is probably the number one thing. I mean, you can always find old sheds. Well, I was going to ask, so how long do they stay on the ground? So like, let's say it start, they start, they're shedding in January, but I mean, how long do they stay on the ground until, you know, time and animals get at them? Well, I've seen sheds that have been, that were shed within a couple of days. They're already chewed on and rodents chew on them, uh, squirrels porcupines i uh, heard even rabbits chew on them okay sometimes and they'll just chew them up and uh and then you got weather and all that and so if they're sitting out in the wide open they'll get bleached out in a year and and then around here if they're in the timber uh not getting any sun they will actually just the moisture getting in them they'll kind of rot and i mean i've found sheds that i figured were laying there for 10 years mm. and they're just they pretty much fall apart so so what area like so where so now we know we know when they shed so so where will they be shedding so you know like are they shedding in bedding areas are they shedding in travel corridors like where are they shedding where where would you find the most i would say focusing on bedding areas and where they're feeding a lot where they're spending most of their time so i mean any any deer elk can shed when it's trap when it's just walking traveling somewhere i mean it just that's when they're going to shed so it doesn't matter where they're at but i would say uh focus in on where they're spending most of their time which would be bedding areas and feeding Mm -hmm. areas okay okay um like so how are they shedding then is it is is it because of so like i would see i'd say yesterday i was seeing like i would see fresh rubs so i'm thinking in my head maybe they're rubbing and it rubs off Mm -hmm. you know or um i would try to find you know, uh, thick, something thick, you know, where they're knocking like, but are the antlers just falling off as they're walking? Are they falling off when they are asleep? Like how, how are they falling off? Like what? just, uh, whenever it's time to fall <laughs> off, they will fall off. I mean, they can obviously, uh, be forced off. Yeah. If yeah. they're rubbing on a tree and it's like, uh, they're going to shed that day. Um, that will obviously help. And you can, whenever I'm looking for specifically like moose paddles, I feel like you find more moose paddles next to a rub than a deer or an elk and i mean you can and i have before but when you're looking for moose paddles yeah you if you find rubs obviously that means that's a bull so he has paddles that you're looking for and so if he's if there's rubs i'd check them all because yeah that's going to force it off more than it just falling off naturally i've found a lot of moose paddles over the years right at the base of a rub where they and you know you can always tell the fresh ones because the all the bark is laying on top of the snow right if you're up there in the snow 
And so, yeah, you sit, sometimes you get into those brush fields where the moose have been and you can look up and you can just see rub trees all over the place. And like Adam said, I just walk from rub to rub to rub. And generally you'll, if you look through enough of them, you'll typically find a moose paddle there. Yeah, that's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. So when, when do the moose drop? Cause you didn't mention that. They're the same as whitetail. The same as whitetail. So yeah. So, like right so now. December and January, and I've even heard of some bulls shedding in November. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So that's actually kind of a cool story. So when my brother got his moose uh, years and years ago, we were hunting in November and there was a bachelor group of bulls up on this hillside and we're watching, we're trying to decide between the two biggest bulls and we, I'm looking at one bull and then I look at the other one and I look back to the bull that I was thinking that we were going to take. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he only has one paddle. <laughs> And we're like, what the heck is going on? And so Colton shoots the other moose and we go up there and I, I still have that paddle. I don't have it here with me right now, but I, it's a big paddle, big double brows, yeah. like eight points over the top. I mean, just tall. It was like a 50 oh inch moose because the bully killed was 49 and they were like really similar. Yeah. And so big Shiris, you know, but yeah, no, that was November 8th. I want to, I think it was. So it was super oh, early. That's, that's way early. Yeah. Super yeah. early. Yeah. That's wild. That's, that's wild. Have you ever seen, like, have, have you ever seen a, an animal shed? Like right in front of you, I personally have not. I've, I've, I know people that have, but yeah. I know I've not. And that comes back to not being able to just sit and watch an animal. Like in a lot of places in the, in the states, like you can, you can watch a herd of mule deer bucks on a winter range and sit there and watch them through the glass all day long. And maybe if you watch them day after day after day, you probably watch one shed. But you can't, yeah. you can't really do that here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. What do they look like? shed yeah so so here here's the thing i know that sounds like a stupid <laughs> question um but but i have a stupid answer for it <laughs> i think i know your answer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, well well colton was messing with me last night uh, or yesterday uh while i was walking through the woods and i'm getting all frustrated i'm sending i'm, I'm like texting to you know to colton and justin like you know what's going on why can't i can't find a, a, a thing out here and um you know, Colton sends me a message. He says, pro tip, they look like sticks. <laughs> and I was really, you don't say. So how, but like, how do you, so, so how do you differentiate? What do you them? look, yeah. I think yeah, like, good that, thing that, is that's, like, that's what, are, what are the things that are, that tip you off? You know, that just catch your eye. What are you there it is. looking for? Yeah, catching your I, eye. I think it comes down to like experience and you just get a, an eye for it. Just like anything in life, you get an eye for it. And so you're saying they, you know, Colton and Justin threw me to the wolves yesterday and they should have come with me. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Jerk. <laughs> well, so, um, I've definitely been fooled by sticks. I mean, that's why I always, I carry binos so you don't have to walk over and check every stick, okay. right? You're walking along and, oh, something caught my eye and I look over and it's like, I mean, it could be because like you've seen, Justin has killed some really freak bulls and they're they kind of are wavy and they look like a stick i mean they're not like the uniform elk antler and so i mean you look at everything and uh yeah i've been fooled many times by sticks but yeah i walked five miles and part of wander walking five miles in a couple hours is just like looking at the stick i'd see a stick over there and i'd walk on over there well here's something yeah. i would recommend this is what we always used to do when we were younger uh, uh, and I'll, and there's something else I also do when I'm shed hunting too, but I'll cover both of them. So something we used to do when we were younger is we took a bunch of sheds that we had. Um, and if you just have antlers or if you can even borrow antlers from somebody, I'm not even joking about like, this is actually really helpful. Go and have somebody throw them out in a little timber patch for you and then walk through there. And what will surprise you is how many you miss. Like if somebody goes like, for instance, I could take five antlers outside right now and put them out here and you guys probably wouldn't find all five of them. You definitely wouldn't. Adam might find most of them <laughs> yeah, <laughs> being serious. No, yeah, I got you. Yeah. And so what'll surprise you is how many times, and I, we have been shed hunting before and I've literally been standing on top of a shed. Uh, I had, I took my boy Scott out last year and I, we were standing there looking around and it was similar to what you're talking about. There's poop everywhere. Yeah. And I'm looking around, I'm like, there's gotta be a shed here. And I'm looking and looking. And there was literally one within two feet of me <laughs> for minutes. And I never saw it. So I'm not the idiot. It's no. Like, and so, yeah. but the, a really good, if you've never done it before, or maybe you've, you've put in just tons of miles. Cause I know guys that have just put in tons of miles. And like I can't find them. I would about guarantee if you're putting in a lot of miles in areas that the animals are, there are sheds there. Um, you're probably walking by them. And so a really helpful practice is to throw them out. 
The second part of that, that I do a lot, um, and I don't know if Adam does this, but I, once I find a shed, uh, because a lot of times, yep. Yeah. A lot of times they, uh, they look different depending if it's rained, the shed will have a different look to it. Um, if it's super dry, it'll be, and sometimes when it's really cold, they'll be almost translucent, some of the whitetail sheds. And so they blend it. And so what I do once I find one is I take it and I wing it all day long. I'll just be walking around and it keeps your eye trained and sharp. And I'll look the other way and I'll throw it up the mountain or whatever, or throw it down the mountain. And then I'll look around and see if I can pick it up. And like probably 70% of the time it's easy to find, but there's 30% of the time where I actually have to go and try and find my shed again. And what that does is it just keeps you constantly looking for those things. And for me, it's all like, it's all shapes is what I'm always looking for. Like arcs and forks. Like those are kind of dead giveaways and you're wrong about it a lot of times, but if you see, you know, you got, they got that just smooth, almost unnatural look to them in the woods. Yep. And then for like whitetail, they, you know, they got all their points in a line. And so if you see like patterns of points, sometimes there are sticks that look, they got like at least like four points in a line and you're like, oh, that must be a shed and it's actually a stick. Yeah. Yeah. But that a lot, just look for patterns, I guess, and and shapes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned earlier the binoculars um, and that was something that, that I thought of actually yesterday while I was walking in the woods, I thought this would be so much easier if I just had some binos, you know, so I can, I can scan a hillside instead of walking down a ravine and going up on the other side and taking mm-hmm. a look, you know, or climbing up those rocks and figuring it out, you know? Um, so, so you take binos. So when, when you go shed hunting, um, what, uh, what are you, I guess first, first, how long are you going, you know, what, and then, and then segue into what you're actually taking when you go. So how long, I mean, it just depends on the day. And, and the, and the reason why I ask that is because how long is probably going to dictate. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if I'm just day shed, if we're not going on a trip mm-hmm. to shed hunt, mm-hmm. I'm just day shed hunting. Um, usually I have a spot in mind that I'm going to go and I've most likely been there before. So I know all the, you know, little nooks and crannies or where the, where the deer are hanging out. And so you go, you know, just comb through those spots. But yeah. I mean... I will go, I will, I mean, I will shed out sometimes for eight hours and just comb, comb. And if it's like, if there's a lot of sign and you, sometimes you get into a spot and it's like overwhelming the amount of area there is to cover. And you're just, if you're by yourself, especially you're trying to comb through it and it, it overwhelms me sometimes. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I get up the hill and I'm like, oh, but I didn't check that spot down there. There could have been something you go back. So, I mean, I go pretty light uh, when I'm just day shed hunting, just, you know, you got your pack. Uh, obviously I, I've only forgot my binos, I think once the other day <laughs> and that typically does not happen. Even if I'm shed hunting in heavy timber, yeah. I got my binos because like I said, look down the hill 50 yards and there's a, something that looks like a shed. You don't want to walk down there, especially if you just came right, up. So you're looking right. at it and also That's sometimes. I was running into. It's, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I will even, if I'm getting into a spot that, oh man, it looks so good. Even in the timber, I'll just take my binos and I will just scan the ground. Just. Just look, and I've found a few just randomly just scanning in the timber. Um, so yeah, go pretty light. You know, you just got your pack, whatever you need, food and water for the day, binos. And I got my dog and we just, just go walk around all day. What, what's the minimum amount of time that someone should devote to looking for a shed in, in an area? Um, like if they, if they're like today, I'm going to go find a shed. If you're really determined to find a shed, you better have a pretty good spot already picked out not just some random place because you Mm. can spend a lot of time into some random (laughs) spot on the hill and not and not because we've all done it yeah and just all look at something and uh, a hillside and you're like oh that looks pretty good i'm gonna check it out and sometimes they just don't live there they don't winter there and so i don't know i think it just depends on where you're going well like you were telling me the other day uh how many uh, how many sheds were found in that one little draw Oh, and that's that one spot. Yeah, the other guy that walked through. Did, didn't he find like eight big mule deer sheds or something like that? Just in one little oh. draw right around the corner. This yeah, a couple so years ago, right? Where, this was last year, actually. Right, so, was he making a YouTube video? <laughs> no, no <laughs> this is just a local guy. Uh, my cousin and I had gone up there and we found one big set and probably like four or five singles. And we thought, man, I guess the bucks just aren't, there's a few bucks here, but we had been finding, I mean, a bunch of really quality bucks the last two years we're like oh maybe they just didn't winter here the majority of them didn't well then the, like the next day this other guy that he shed hunts there we just try to beat him 
he goes, and we were, he went just literally a hundred yards around the hill into this little thick draw that we didn't check because there was no big trails heading in there. So, I mean, you're looking at, in the snow, you're looking at their, their oh, yeah. trails oh, and, and their beds. Yeah. And so yeah. you just follow, yeah, follow yeah. the trail. That's what I was doing. Yeah. yeah. So he just went around the corner where we didn't go and he found where all the big bucks shed. I mean, on one hillside, I don't know, he found like three big sets and, a, and he matched up all the other ones we had found. Oh, that, and then that, that just, drives me nuts when people are like, oh, I found the matching set. And I'm like, what? You found the matching set? And, and what, what gets me the most is when I, it, it, how do you know? If you find the matching set from year to year. So like one person, was, was it you? You found a matching set between, or was it somebody else? I yeah, was we got of. lots of matching sets. Yeah, well, sets but, but like mm-hmm. what, one year you found, a, uh, somebody found a left. And then in the next year, they're like, oh, I found the right to the same deer. And I was like, what? Oh, they're so similar. You can generally tell. I mean, sometimes they're hard to tell, but you pretty much know what you're dealing with when you find one. Yeah. yeah. Like I found, for instance, last year I found a, a four-point uh, fresh brown in a spot I'd never been before. I just wanted to check it out. Found it, and I didn't match it up. Well, I went back this year and was on the same exact hillside and found a right side fresh with blood on it. And I immediately was like, that's the same buck I found last year, just his fresh side. And I, I didn't match it up either. And I got it home, and yep, it, you could call it a set. He didn't change like at all. But you just, you just know when you spend this much time looking at antlers, you can just tell. So here's a couple of things, though, that I think would be helpful for guys that get into shed hunting. Uh, number one is, in my experience, you can hike all around these mountains. And you can hike for hours and hours and hours. And I, there are multiple spots that I have that you could look everywhere. But until you get into it, like a 10-acre patch, I can consistently, I can walk for hours up the mountain and get to this 10-acre patch and then zigzag the patch. And I will always come up with sheds. And so, and that's very common everywhere. So uh, we have a video from last spring when we were bear hunting and Shane and I are up in this Canyon and we had been going all day glass in both sides. It's wide open. Couldn't find a shed to save our lives. We finally get into this one little fold and I glass over there. And I think I saw three or four sheds with the binos just across the way. And in about a hundred acre patch in an hour and a half, I picked up 17 elk sheds Wow! in a hundred acre That's patch. Wild. And they, there was, and we spent, and then we went back a couple of weeks later and we spent two days up there. And I was all over that mountain and I got back into that patch again and fi- I found a couple more elk sheds, but they were all in that hundred acres. Now out of th- a couple thousand acres, that's a little tiny chunk. And so my, my encouragement is, is like, you're kind of in the right spot and there'll be sign everywhere, but the bulls, when it comes to elk, the bulls will all mash up and the bucks will do the same thing. And they just have like, they get that Southern exposure, they get the right food, they're protected, they've got good visibility or whatever it is, uh, but they find those areas that they like. and. Uh, in that spot, I found three years of the same bull laying on top of each other within a couple hundred yards of each other. So, uh, and that shows that, I mean, they're really, they're really like creatures of habit. You know, they're, they're really like, the, so, that, so from year to year, they're not, they're, they're not moving much and they're, they're staying you know, pretty much in the same spot. And even, even like you said, like the sheds from one year to the next, it's not like the antler growth was exponentially different. That kind of that kind of dispels the myth that some guys they go, oh, we'll let them grow another year, and it's like, well, at some point this this animal's gonna be at the point that he's at. You mm-hmm. know, you can let him grow as many more years as you want. He's just gonna start going yeah, backwards they eventually. Add, they don't add much. Right, right, exactly. Uh, and it depends actually, because we found some that's like, oh man, it grew twenty inches last year. Totally, yeah. So, I but think it might it, be an age thing too. An know? age yeah. thing, or just the year the the quality of food they had, the how how hard the winter was. Yeah. Um, a bunch of factors so you said that you know you've got a thousand acres and then you've got a one you know one patch so out of that i mean how do you find that one patch because because you could be i mean i mean it would be a long time to scour it just that well i'll give you an example i found one spot and it's been my like go-to spot for finding mule deer sheds kind of like adam has some um and i spent days looking around and I did not find anything. And then I took one more day. I was just like, I'm going to go zigzag this one section. And I was up there for six hours and hadn't found a shed. And all of a sudden I get into this little patch, which I now hit hard. And in a matter of minutes, I'd picked up eight mule deer sheds. And then I came down and I came back down through it and ended up finding a couple of elk, shed, like raghorn elk sheds and stuff like that. But it was like 10 or 11. This is quite a while ago. But it was like 10 or 11. And I'd been up there all day and it was just a matter of minutes. And so 
now what I do is, and every once in a while you'll find them outlying that area. Um, or, or sometimes they'll shift into a different draw depending on snow conditions or whatever. But once you can just kind of beeline into some of those areas and really focus on them. But the other thing that I didn't get to say earlier that I want to encourage, because I know a lot of guys go out there and they get super discouraged. Uh, it comes back to the timing situation. So when I was a kid, and this wasn't all that long ago, 20 years ago, when I really, 20, 25 years ago, when I first started getting into this, um, there was very minimal pressure for people looking for sheds. In other words, what would happen is we'd wait until the elk started shedding and we'd go out there and we'd pick up elk sheds and mule deer sheds and whitetail sheds and nobody was looking for them. Now, guys, I mean, and you see it on YouTube, guys are watching these things shed and they're going out and picking them up. So one of the problems that people might think that they're looking in the wrong spot, you could actually be looking in the right spot, but you're a day, a week, two weeks behind the guys that have been in there already. And so that's one thing. And like, I know where you went yesterday because I drove by and saw your car and I've already seen a bunch of guys have been in there shed hunting, yeah. right? And so, yeah, I would, and, I, and I did I see a couple of blueprints. Uh, Colton sent me there. Oh, Colton yeah, sent he me. would do something like that. He's the one. He's yeah. the one that did that. We well, Colton a, was supposed we got to a take name me to, for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, well, <laughs> um, well, yeah. Colton was the one that sent me over there, and uh, he actually sent me originally to a spot that, um, and this this kind of goes to the problem of uh, that we're experiencing in the West over here with real estate he sent me into a spot that he said oh there, you can go walk over there and there was a house brand new construction sitting right there and i'm like nope can't walk there anymore <laughs> you know there I, and he's like what, what, what was the problem i said it's somebody's front lawn <laughs> there's no <laughs> way you know he's yeah. like oh really are you serious down in there i was like yep well that's, that's somebody, where yeah. that's where having mapping stuff like base map for us has been a total game changer in fact in idaho they changed the laws so it used to be it, land had to be posted no trespassing um, to actually get like a trespassing charge against you. Now, because of the mapping stuff like base map, Onyx, all those, um, now it's on, the onus is on you to know where you are. And that's why having that stuff, and what's really cool about it now is there's all this land that you didn't realize was actually public land too uh, before that I'd driven by. And so that's a that's an issue. Yeah, yeah. And then, sure. Colton, and then when Colton picked me up for me to come over to your house and uh, he goes, yeah, but did you go in that spot? And I was like, no, dude. <laughs> he goes, well, you should have gone over there. I said, I went where you told me to go. So <laughs> the funny thing, though, as I'm thinking about what we're talking about, is all I can think about is um, the desire that we all have to be successful in a yeah. variety of ways, right? Like we have this desire, we're talking today about shed hunting. Um, yet there's all these ways that we think are the way that we're going to become successful and we don't, we end up meeting failure and not actually achieving what we're after, right? And so Proverbs 14, 12, uh, talks about how there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. Uh, and God tells Joshua, like, if you don't turn to the right or the left, if you focus on my word, if you focus on doing my will, um, you're going to be prosperous and you're going to have good success. And what's cool, like when we want to learn about something, we go to somebody that has been there, done that, understands the, like the mechanics of how to find sheds, and we can learn from them and then we can be successful. And so when we talk about life, in general, whether it's marriage, going through life, work, like all of it, and then eternity, um, God is the creator of it all. And when we think about the word of God, uh, it's like, it's kind of like an instruction manual, right? And he, God understands how, he understands best how everything works from your life to marriage, to parenting, everything. He understands how that all works best, right? And so what happens is as we follow God's word and his instruction on how to do it, that's where, as he tells Joshua, you will find success, you will be prosperous. And I just think that's such a cool thing. Like we do it, we're so quick to look for people that are better than us so that we can learn from them so we can have success in the things that they're successful in. But when it comes to life, no one lives life better than God, right? And so we can go to his word and find that success. And it's not like we don't have to find some YouTube video. Like you can literally just open the word of God and find the success that we're looking for, which is pretty cool in life. Yeah. Yeah. So Well, that, that, that goes to, I mean, you have so many people like they go, well, you know, you're, the difference between me and you, you, well, you talk to an atheist and an atheist will look at you and say, well, you know, I mean, we both, we both live our lives. And, you know, the difference between me and you is that I don't have anything holding me back where it's like, I, I say, I say to that, I go, well, God doesn't hold me back. He actually helps me to live a more successful and more fulfilling life, you know, because if God is the one who created us, then naturally he's going to know you know, how our lives ought to go and how we ought to have, you know, perfect direction. And, 
it's like it's like the world team seems to just try uh try to distract and try to you know they're always trying to figure it out on their own and every time they figure it try to figure it out on their own if a country starts going in a particular way and they're like oh we're gonna we're gonna we, we know what's best and we know how we want marriage to be and we know how we want families to be and we know how we want children to be and we're going to change things it's like god made a mistake you know <laughs> yeah. you know like like god made a mistake in this direction so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and you know do do a way that we want and, and it always ends up being you know destructive you look at history and you look at different empires and you look at you know the rise and fall of civilization it seems to be like every time the countries start you know downgrading going away from the will of god and changing what god's natural order is and not natural plan for life it, destruction comes totally yeah i mean that comes back to his ways are higher like he just has a so much better understanding and so like, and I think life experience teaches us that, like, we just have ideas and we think it's going to work out well and it doesn't, but God is always right. And so just trusting that his perspective really is higher, even when we think we have a better way. Like, and that's the reality. So one of the things that Adam and I experience is taking guys out that don't know much about hunting and they try and run the show and call the sh- And it's like, it's so bizarre because like their best chance of being successful is to follow our lead on it just because we have more experience in the situation. But people are so interesting how you could tell them how to do everything right. And they're still going to go out there and think you're wrong and they can do it better. And they're unsuccessful. And you see that with the amount of unfilled tags every year when it comes to hunting. So, yeah, I don't know. Just kind of an interesting thought I was thinking about as we're talking about all the shed hunting, but you know, one of the things that I'm jealous of Adam for when it comes to shed hunting is that, um, he has a dog. I was just about to say that. I was just, <laughs> I was thinking it, and I was like, "Hold on, wait a second here. You got a dog, bro." I know I'm not supposed to covet, but still, <laughs> we went up to go look for moose sheds the other day, and he's like, "Any sheds my dog brings back to me are mine." Yeah, I was like, "I don't have a dog." <laughs> so, so wait, is so so yeah, that, and I I had heard you say that multiple times while you're telling me about this, and I'm thinking to myself, "Hmm, hmm, okay, okay, but you have a dog." <laughs> so. <laughs> So how much does that dog contribute to your shed hunting? How much better uh, is is it that the fact that you have the dog? Yeah. And how I, long have you had the dog? Okay, so I have a silver lab. He's four and a half years old, right in his prime. He's last year he was phenomenal at finding sheds, so I'm just I'm really excited for this season. But yeah, I would say most of the time he's better than me at finding. I mean, he's got a nose; he can smell them. I'm just relying on sight. But, uh, I mean, and some, some days when he doesn't find any, I, I blame it on myself. He's probably thinking, well, you took me into a horrible spot. There's no sheds here anyway, but no, it's actually amazing how many I've missed that he, he brings to me. Like last year, for example, I found the biggest set of mule deer sheds I've ever picked up and I had already walked past them. Uh, I was with my cousin and we already, we were almost down to the truck and there was this blow down fir tree which you should always check them because the deer eat the moss off of them in the winter oh, so okay okay it's like that's like number one and for yeah. some reason we both were on either side of it and we just walked right past it yeah. and i was down below it and duke is my dog he he comes out of the brush that's and he's such got a this dog name yeah. that's <laughs> <laughs> he comes out with this this monster mule deer shed has it by the by the base and he just bringing it out to me and i was oh my gosh my jaw probably dropped and then we searched around for the other one and he ended up finding it too. He pulled it out of the tree. And yeah, it's been amazing actually. I can't even see shed hunting without without a dog. It all started with um when I was a kid, we had a yellow lab, a female. And we'd always shed hunted. My dad's shed hunted forever. And he we have this lab and we never trained her to do anything she just went along and one day i think she was like a year and a half old she is sitting down the hill and she's like looking up at us and we're like what and we go down there and there's a set of whitetail sheds and we're like oh my gosh she actually found these and was waiting for us so she found those and then it just a snowball effect she was she's she was actually better than my dog is now but i mean she probably in her 10 years of life she found probably three or four hundred sheds herself that most of the time we would have never found you like, never trained that dog no never trained. so that so that was my next question was okay so so let's say all right somebody has a dog let's say a guy has a dog house dog you know i got a dog 
I mean, he's 120 pounds and, you know, <laughs> uh, struggles, but you know I mean? Like it, it, should they just bring their dog just period? Just like, I mean, cause a lot of people have dogs, but they're not trained shed dogs. Yeah. Well, is so, there a type of dog that's better? For that's what I, that's what I'm asking. I, like, is it, can you just take a dog with you? Like, w- w- what's, what's the deal? Probably. I mean, I, I see a lot of guys that have shed dogs. It's usually like a lab or some kind of retriever, um, a dog with a good nose. Um, what I did is I didn't like corgi. a corgi, yeah, you know, a chihuahua, something like that. I was like thinking that. chihuahua, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. those tactical toy dogs that you could release out of your right, backpack. Right. The problem with that is they're not, they're not big enough to pack anything, any size back to you. Yeah. And I know a lot of guys will have dogs that they'll find sheds, but they won't bring them back. And you'll walk up and, oh, it has dog slobber on it or something. Like your dog found it. But so what I did, um, so I had our first dog and she was amazing. And then I got Duke right at the end of her life. And he never got to get out with her. And I've always thought, okay, if I'm going to do this right, I'm going to get a dog. I'm going to train him up. And then when he's like five or six, you know, kind of getting up there in years, getting a little bit slower, get another one and train it and have it go out with the experienced dog and kind of learn from them. And so that's kind of what I'm planning on doing. But so I had her, he didn't really get to go out with her. So I just told myself, I said, okay, when he's a puppy, he's not getting any toys. He's all he gets is antlers to chew on. I want him to just be obsessed with an antler. Just love him. And then when he was probably uh, four four months or something, you know, getting around pretty good, I would play fetch with an antler just every day, day after day. And then I got to the point where he just, he would bring him back every time. And then I expanded that and I'd go out and I would throw him just randomly out and then take him out and then have him find him and bring him back to me. And he was just he was just caught onto it super fast. The only downside I could see to that is, you know, you could better hide your trophies. <laughs> Cause I, I remember when we were moving, when we were moving out of, uh, out of Georgia, going up to Pennsylvania and, um, uh, we had like, everything was in boxes and stuff. And we, you know, I had my, I had my, um, my, my dead heads, I had everything just kind of like hanging before. And I brought them all down and then we went to, we went to the store or something. We went to the grocery store or something. We come back and there's my dog just like laying in the living room, just, nomming on you know nomming on heads yeah and like that was awesome yeah <laughs> oh yeah i almost lost it well it's actually amazing i've never had that problem i have this big box of antlers and just this huge stack in my room and it they're all just right there i mean he's in the house he could he goes and sniffs them but he knows that he's not allowed to touch those ones and he has never once pulled one out of the box that's a good dog he will, <laughs> I'll throw him one and be like, oh, there you go. That's yeah. yours. And he'll, he'll eat it. I mean, just chew it to nothing. My but, dog yep. ate like the face off my first, my, my first deer. <laughs> nice. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, going back to, has it, does it make me a better shed hunter? Absolutely. I mean, he, he at least finds half of the sheds I, I own. And because of him, like I would, maybe I think sometimes I'm lucky at finding sheds. I'm just, I just find them. So on, Randomly, th- on but... Thursday, I'm going to go shed hunting. I'm going to take you with me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just commandeer you. Be you like, can just okay. take my dog. Oh, yeah. I know, right? <laughs> Forget you, man. Yeah. He's so, a better one dog. anyway. Yeah, yeah. Two things that are kind of cool about that. I was thinking um, when you were talking about training up your next one, because Duke never got to be with your last dog. And just kind of cool your philosophy of training him up, and but just by example. Um, and that's like the core of discipleship, right? Is somebody that's farther along in your walk than you showing you kind of how to, how to figure it out. And so, uh, obviously we're not offering to take anybody shed hunting. We barely have enough time for stuff as it is, but like finding somebody that has a little bit, even if it's just a little bit more experience than you right. and going out with them and cutting your teeth that way, instead of trying to figure it out on your own can be a huge advantage locally where you are. Cause one thing that we talked about in the beginning was everything is so much different depending on where you are. Like where we live, we've kind of figured out how to approach it and where they are, right? The sheds are. Right. But we head down, yeah, we head down and we're hunting in more breaks and open country. And same kind of principles. You'll find patches of antlers in those different areas, but um, just a little bit different technique. You can glass a lot more, spotting scope, stuff like that. So, yeah, pretty cool. And then I, my question, my second thing I was was, have you ever found an antler that Duke couldn't find? I couldn't find. Maybe. Yeah, that Duke couldn't find. 
I have definitely found antlers, and I'm like, he just walked through here. Like, why didn't he get this one? And there's been moments like that. I don't know if there's been a specific time where maybe I was looking for a match, and I, we search and search and search, and I happened to find it um, before him. I mean, yeah, probably, but um, definitely, yeah, I've, I've noticed he's missed some, and I think that comes down to, like, he definitely will see them, and he knows, boom, that's a shed, and he'll go grab it. But I think um, different sheds, have they smell differently, and some don't sm- don't put out as much scent, and he, re- I mean, obviously relies on his nose a lot. I mean, I'll watch him going down the hill, and I can tell if he's smelling a rabbit or a shed. Mm-hmm. A rabbit, I mean, nose to the ground, tails wagging. Gotcha. He smells a so shed. he does get distracted. He, oh, yeah, just like okay, any yeah, other dog. Yeah, gotcha. Um, but he'll put his nose up and just smell the air. And he'll just start, he just following his nose. His nose is not on the ground, it's smelling the air. Gotcha. And he'll he's follow not, he's his not nose. following a trail. Nope. That's it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a scent in there, yeah. like coming off. And, but that's one thing I've had to learn when I'm out there. I'm not, I'm not always just looking, looking, looking. I'm paying attention to him, like what he, what's he doing? Because sometimes I'll see him do that and then he'll just go and I'm like, ah, I think he probably smelled something and I'll go over there. And sometimes it's like, oh, if he just went a little bit farther, there it was. And he's he's a really good dog. He won't go more than seventy five yards from me, and so he'll get out kind of to that edge, and I'll see that he's kind of on something. I'll have to encourage him, like keep going, keep going, or he'll come back, and and we'll have to go scour the area. But I gotta um I gotta bring up something because you know like so you know my my role in in Limitless is uh, part of it is is reading through the comments and and you know responding to people and responding to emails that that, that people write in and whatnot. And a lot of one thing that I see a whole bunch that I got to figure out how to creatively answer is um, you're destroying the environment by shed hunting and you're making it more difficult for uh, animals and you're removing minerals from the ground. So how would you respond to that? How would you how would you, you know, come back at that and let people know that this is this is fine? Well, for one, I don't think people touch even a fraction of the antlers that get shed every year. Because if you look around throughout the year and you see a buck here, a buck there, a bull here, whatever, every single one of them sheds two. <laughs> and we right. find, like, I, I, around here, if a good year is if I find like 50. Yeah. That's nothing. Right. You know, that's 25 animals out of how many? I don't know. Yeah. yeah An uncountable you're a professional amount. Professional shed hunter. Someone yeah. would be like, okay, how about, but what if, what if you have, 500 people hitting the mountainside looking for sheds. Yeah. Well, but I would, I would doubt that there are, do, there are that many. Well, there's know. times and places, you know, I mean, I think, I think I, it's a total, it's a valid argument. You know, some of the states have switched to opening shed season at a certain point. I'm actually surprised Idaho and Montana haven't done that. There's places within the states that that's the case. Um, like on preserves, like in Montana, they wait until May 15th and open up some of the, like the winter habitat. Um, so it is a real thing and like, it's changed a lot in the last few years, but kind of to reiterate what Adam was saying, it is amazing. If you actually comb these mountains, there are sheds still laying everywhere, ranging from one to 10 years old on the mountain. And, um, most of the time they're totally unmolested and left alone. And as far as removing nutrients, that's a joke. You're talking about (laughs) a, a single like in the scope of everything, it's a needle in a haystack. Like you're not removing really anything. I think people, they don't really understand. I think that there are a lot of people that they watch these videos and then they, they, you know, they're well-meaning, you know, they, they, they love the environment and everything, but they, they maybe they live in a city or they're not like personally involved. And as you become more personally involved, like we, we, we all live in the country and we are always, we're always in the woods. We're always in the mountains. We're always, you know, walking and trekking and doing what we're doing, you know, no matter where we are. And that's just kind of part of who we are. And uh, I would say that even even with the influx of hunters that we've seen, um, and and it's not as high as some people think. Uh, I've seen the, I've seen the numbers from different DNR agencies, and it's just simply not as high as as one might think. And in fact, in some states, it's actually lowering the the hunting population. Um, and that would include cheddar hunters. I think that people they see it they see it published on YouTube. And they see a lot of these videos, and when they see these videos, they th- they must think everybody's doing this. 
you know, and it, it immediately, you know, it makes everything exponentially larger. It's like when you go to another country and, and they, they're, they're talking about some sort of pop star that we don't even listen to or watch or anything. They're like, oh, all Americans are like this. It's like, no, sh- just that show. But it just so happens that you see that, but you're not culturally involved. You know, it's, you know. I think at its core, though, like most, most hunters, not all hunters, but most hunters are conservationists, right? right? And That's so right. Yeah. Yeah. there's a level of, like, you're not running, you're not trying to go in there and run animals around. You know what I mean? So you're, you're thoughtful. Like Adam, typically, like he was talking about, waits until they're all shed out instead of going in there. And it doesn't work well for you if they're not shed out yet and then you run them out of the spot. Right. And so you got to kind of be thoughtful in that. And I don't know, man, you can start, that's the problem with our country in a lot of ways is that we've started to legislate everything and you have to make a rule for absolutely everything. And it takes away so many freedoms instead of people just being considerate and thoughtful in how they're doing things. And I think that's where you just got to stay. Well, I think that's the answer to the shed hunting uh, questions is just being thoughtful about it. Because at the end of the day, it's a really cool thing to find the same bucks in the same spots year after year. Um, and yeah, it's just fun. Like Adam's been hunting these bucks now, some of the big ones. And one thing I want to say before we wrap this up is Adam has an awesome uh, shed hunting video that you can check out uh, That it, with him finding that huge set last year, that big heavy mm-hmm. set. But Adam's picked up some magnum muleys over the years. He's got a double drop tine muley and uh, just some really big quality bucks over the years. So just an exceptional, exceptional collection so far. Sweet. So, um, so in much the same way, it's nice to go with somebody at least the first time, you know, unlike what I did yesterday. Yeah. It's also nice to be discipled. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. With everything in life. I mean, when you go and you start a new job, mm-hmm. they give you on the job training. Yeah. And when you got God, who is the author and finisher of our faith, um, and he's the one who created us, formed us, and has our eternity in his hand. And so his instruction is the best instruction there is. And so that's found in the word of God. And, uh, we wrote a resource years ago called the first mile just to help you navigate. Like if you're new to Jesus and understanding who he is, um, it's a resource that'll help you navigate who God is, why you need a relationship with him, how to have a relationship with him and just really practical steps. Kind of like talking about, you know, making sure you're looking in those blow down trees and throwing antlers out. Like these are just little tips and tactics, right? That's the whole heart of the first mile is teaching people those things that they're lessons that you learn over time, but if we could give them to you in advance, maybe you could start really accelerating your walk with Jesus. And that's what the first mile is. And we also have, um, so that's the resource. You can, we give it absolutely free. We'll send it to you. Um, you can go over to our website. It's www.limitlesshunting.com. We pay for shipping and everything. But also, if you want to go even another step, uh, we've started training leaders. And um, by the time you're listening to this, we actually have these groups ongoing right now. And so uh, but you'll, you can join on zoom and a leader is going to take three to six guys through the first mile, being able to answer questions, uh, help really facilitate and grow you in your faith. And so that's going to be a big, that's a, that's a big deal. Yeah, those are weekly classes. And that's yeah. a weekly for about yep. a seven week period. That's right. Um, so yeah, and it's on zoom so you can be anywhere in the world, uh, and do that. But yeah, we just, it, that discipleship, it cuts the learning curve way down so that you're walking in success and not just struggle and failure, mm-hmm. trying to live the life that God really has for you. And Jesus has. I came to give life and life abundantly. And I believe that. And we see that in our own lives. So, yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Very good. Well, it's been good. Cool. You want yeah. to, you think uh, you're, you, you, think you're do a, you gained anything? I, I, I think I want to take Adam with me. <laughs> I think, <that's>, <laughs> <laughs> I, think yeah. I, I think, uh, uh, I, I really like to hit the woods again before I, before I head back out. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. That it was arranged. Yeah. I appreciate that. That'd be good. Maybe, um, sure. if, if you're good, if I you're know, a good right? boy, if I'm a good boy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, um, I think that it's, it's kind of like, uh, and we'll, I'll tell this story another time. Um, but it's like when I, when I first arrowed, arrowed my first bear, all I wanted to do is go out and hunt bear again. You know, like now I've been out looking for sheds and now all I want to do is go look for sheds again. I you know, yep. it's, yeah, it's addicting. Yeah. Any other last parting advice you have for somebody that wants to be a shedaholic like you? Yeah. Well, <laughs> he's like, don't <laughs> just, yeah, no, I don't want anybody out there. <laughs> no, I just said time. And, and even though like in the fall you're hunting, that's scouting for shed hunting and vice versa. I mean, shed hunting is scouting for, for hunting. And so like, I've always thought, uh, like if I'm hunting mule deer in the rut in November, that's the start of winter. 
So when they're done rutting, they're not going to go, tra- I mean, around here, they don't just go travel miles and miles and miles to their winter ground. Like that's usually their winter ground. And so if I've found a bucks or a bunch of deer while I'm out rifle hunting, I'll go hit those spots. And that's a lot of the, my good spots. Like I'll, I'll, I hunt them in the, in the fall too. So just spend time and always just keep, keep note of where you're seeing stuff. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining us. And just I hope that just like Joshua here, you may have learned something cool uh, that you can implement and find success in shed hunting if that's your thing. Uh, if you're new in your walk with Jesus or rekindling your walk, again, we have that resource, The First Mile. We want to get that to you. It's absolutely free and just see you grow there because really we, we want to see is we want to see people give their life to the Lord and watch how God just totally radically transforms your life into the life that really, I think everybody's always been pursuing. And so we have those resources for you. And again, we just want to thank you for joining us and we hope we'll see you next time. God bless you all and take care.